All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to this workshop. This is um, a introduction to computer vision. And specifically, we're going to go through kind of step by step and build our own uh, object detection model. And all the steps we're going to cover is something that you can do outside of this workshop on your own data set. So I really, you know, I think the best way of learning is doing projects. So take what you learned here today, try to do it on a different data set and kind of see what problems you run into because we'll talk about computer vision labeling and that can actually just be a, um, you know, a major factor on your model uh, alone. So set up uh, just for anyone coming in, uh, we're going to be using a data science uh, online environment called uh, Google Colab. So really all you need is a modern web browser like Google Chrome and a Google account so that you can save the code and um, make your own copy and, and, and run everything. And then we're going to use this data labeling tool, which is made by the company I work at called SixSkill. I can't copy in presentation mode. Sorry, let me go back. And we have this promo code for 90 days free. Uh, totally recommend you trying it out. And we're going to kind of walk step by step how to use this to create your own data sets. It's uh, very easy to do. Um, and I would love to hear your feedback. So as you, as you go through, you know, if you think anything could be better or have any feedback on it, I'd love to hear about it too. And it's uh, easy sign up. There's no card required or anything like that. So just go in and uh, put in that promo code. What this workshop is. So this is hopefully a super friendly introduction to computer vision, um, kind of designed for no previous experience expected, but knowing Python will probably be really helpful when we get to the coding section. Uh, but don't worry, if you're pretty new to it, I will kind of explain line by line. And if you have any questions, if something doesn't make sense, uh, feel free to ask it in the chat. So this is going to be pretty interactive. And I'll uh, definitely ask you questions or ask if things make sense. And please let me know in the chat um, if they do or if they don't. So we're going to cover applications and basic intuition. And then we're really going to focus mainly on kind of practical stuff. So we're going to dive in and you're going to be able to create your own data set, learn how to do that. And then we're going to jump into the code, take the data set or learn how to take the data set that you will train and uh, or, or that you will label. And then we're going to train a model on it and then see how to run that model on uh, images and video. Um, you can't learn everything in two hours. So like I was talking to some people that were here a little bit earlier. Um, you know, where there's going to be some stuff. If you've never done anything before in machine learning, I'm going to cover some stuff at a very high level. And I think intuitively it will make sense, but you'll probably want to go back and uh, cover a little bit more around deep learning. Uh, but you're going to be, I think, surprised with how far you can get without even knowing every single thing that happens behind the scenes. But hopefully you can learn enough, you know, to get really excited about computer vision and you can learn enough to really just start solving problems with it. It's really exciting. I've seen a lot of people after this workshop share some stuff they've been working on or they'll label their own data set and share with me like their object detection. Um, so if you do that, let me know. I'd love to see it. Parts of it may feel fast paced or challenging just depending on your background. Um, it's a typo. That's uh, totally okay. Uh, you'll learn a lot, I think, by sticking through it and then asking questions. And you know, not everything needs to make sense right away. You're going to have copies of all the code and everything, so you can always go back and kind of pick it apart later. And then keep learning after this workshop. So I'll point you to some resources afterwards. Thank you, Galvanize. Um, if you don't know who Galvanize is, they are a really awesome a boot camp for data science and web development. And they're also a co-working space. They have several locations around the US. They also, uh, before COVID, hosted a lot of events. So if you're ever looking to go to a meetup or put on a meetup, they're a really great space for that. And then they also offer um, enterprise training as well. And they have a really good little free prep course that I'll post the link in here. Um, and by prep course, it actually covers quite a bit in like Python and SQL and other areas. Um, I've had friends that have used this actually to just kind of brush up on their programming skills to get ready for an interview, interview, even though they had a lot of experience. So if you're just kind of looking for something to go through some stuff in like Python or SQL, that's a good resource for it. A little bit about me. My name is Sage Elliott. I'm a machine learning developer evangelist at sixskill.com. I'll share this link with you here. If you want to check out our website, it has a lot of information about us. Uh, we do really cool stuff with machine learning specifically a lot of stuff right now around computer vision and uh, IoT. So we, we work with a lot of people and train custom models and find solutions for their problems, but we're also making tools to make it easier for everyone to do those things on their own. So one tool you're going to actually see is going to be the labeling product. 
Uh, for about the past decade, I've worked in software and uh, hardware companies or, or roles, uh, uh, usually with startups or kind of agencies in Seattle, Washington. And then like I was telling someone earlier who's from Orlando, uh, Melbourne, Florida. So I love making things with technology and you can stay connected with me at all these places. I'll actually just post some links in the chat real quick. Um, I know a lot of people will like to ask questions after the workshop and I am happy to answer them. Uh, the best places to reach out to me is in the Slack channel, the uh, kind of a six skill community Slack channel. And then also the, uh, you can just message me on LinkedIn. I'm very active in both of those places. So both of those are good places to reach out. About you. So normally I would love to go around the room doing in-person workshops and have you introduce yourselves and kind of get a little sense of the background. But usually at these events, uh, doing a remote RCP is kind of too high and that, that would take too long. Uh, but communicate in the chat. Uh, a lot of people already kind of said where they were uh, watching this from. You could, you could say hello again in there, or you could just keep talking during the workshop. Or if you want to stay connected, go to that Slack channel. There's an introduction channel, and I would love it uh, if you posted a tiny blurb about yourself in there, what you're learning, what your background is. Um, and yeah, we can, we can talk in there. So one of my favorite things about going to meetups um, is meeting people and learning what they're working on. And I really miss that about doing the virtual ones because it feels a little bit harder. Um, it's, you know, you don't really hang out and talk afterwards as much. Um, and I'm trying to kind of recreate that with this Slack channel. So you can join it there and introduce yourself. Set up repeat for anyone who just came in, um, just modern web browser, Google account for Google Colab, and then you just want to sign up at this link here for the labeling product. And then use this promo code webinar 90 day, all caps for nine days free. Again, easy sign up, just put in your email, promo code, no card or anything required. And I would love to hear your feedback. All right, are we ready? Uh, what is computer vision? So it's a very big field, uh, but typically, you know, I, I kind of just boil it down to how computers gain understanding from images and videos. And here's kind of an example, this model we trained to detect trucks and this is an example of image segmentation or object segmentation. So you can see it's actually drawing, you know, pixels around where it thinks the truck is. And in this case, if the truck is moving, it uh, kind of draws green around it. So it understands, hey, this is a moving truck. And you can see these are stationary trucks and it's drawing kind of red pixels around again, exactly where it thinks the truck is. And you can see it's slightly off. Most models aren't perfect, um, but this is a pretty good, pretty good example. And you can also see these squares drawn around it. So if we just had these squares drawn around it and it, we didn't understand exactly which pixels were the truck, this would be an example of kind of just object detection. Like it knows where it is in the image, uh, but it doesn't necessarily know exactly what pixel belongs to the object. Um, and also I wanted to note, so there, there are other types of uh, data that can kind of be lumped in with computer vision. So you can think of audio data. You've probably seen examples of it looking like a, you know, in some sort of visualized format, like a wave. Um, so that can be converted to, uh, I always get it confused if it's a spectrogram or a spectrograph. I always get them confused. I think it's a spectrograph and that's kind of the waveform of, of audio. And you can actually train a convolutional neural network, one of the most popular computer vision uh, deep learning methods to, uh, to uh, by looking at those images so you can actually understand sound or generate sound. And then there's some other types too that there might be like 3D um, kind of images like LIDAR, LIDAR spatial points in some self-driving car applications. So, you know, I usually say kind of images or videos, but there's kind of other data types that can kind of be converted to an image or data, uh, image or uh, video type format. Why I love computer vision, I think it's a really exciting field. And one of the reasons why I think it's so exciting right now is just if you look around today with what people are doing with computer vision, it's awesome. Like there's a lot of practical applications that you can do right now and that you can bring to so many different fields that maybe aren't even utilizing it right now. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those. So who uses computer vision? So more and more companies are using um, machine learning and computer vision just across multiple fields. Here are just some examples that you've probably heard of already or that you've even experienced yourself. Um, so has anyone happened to go to an Amazon Go store? I, I know they're not everywhere yet. There's several in Seattle. There's some in some other states. I'm not sure if they're out of the country yet. 
but they're a really interesting kind of convenience store or they have a go grocery store where it's a little bit larger and it's just an array of cameras and uh, uh, processing units above and it uses computer vision to do everything. So you walk in, you scan your phone and then you pick up what you want and you walk out and it feels like you're stealing because you don't have to talk to anyone. You don't have to wait in line to check out. The first time you do it, it feels really weird. Then you kind of get a little bit used to it. Um, and then I'm always afraid I might go do it at a store that isn't Amazon Go because I'll be so used to just being like, oh, like a robot's checking me out somewhere with computer vision. But I think it's a really cool application. And I think it's really taken off right now during COVID as well, because you don't have to wait in line with people. You don't have to interact with a human if you don't want to. Uh, you know, they're experimenting with delivery robots, self-driving cars. Uh, I actually think just yesterday, was it, they kind of unveiled, I think, their first self-driving car because they bought a company called Zoots not too long ago. Um, looking at images that get uploaded to Amazon. Google, you, if you've ever used Google Photos, you can, you know that you could probably uh, uh, search a term and it'll find, you know, all the dogs in your photo rolls or whatever you search for. Uh, content filtering on, on YouTube, self-driving cars, you know, Tesla, self-driving cars, Facebook, face tagging, kind of, you know, all these big tech companies you've probably seen or heard about these before. What I, what I find really exciting are all the other kind of fields that aren't your typical big tech company, just where can you use computer vision or, or you know, machine learning to start making differences in other fields. So here's some really, uh, uh, really cool examples like healthcare, uh, people are using it to do x-ray diagnostics, MRI scans, research in medicine, like actually creating it, manufacturing, quality assurance, measuring throughput, uh, supply chain, oil and gas safety and leak detection, agriculture, crop monitoring, animal, animal monitoring, construction, you know, site monitoring for safety and other various things, self-driving tractors, image generation. I'll, I'll share this link in the chat if you want to look at it. Um, there's, a, there's things called GANs and there's some other generation algorithms that are really good as well. And that, that one I shared has pictures of faces that look real, but they actually aren't real. Um, and that was made by machine learning. Um, but I want to ask you, are there any other fields that you're excited to see computer vision in or that I didn't mention. This is by no means all of them. These are just kind of some of the ones that I think are really cool off the top of my head. And we actually work a lot in kind of all these different verticals, um, a lot of stuff in like agriculture and oil and gas at Six Skills. So it's really cool just seeing these applications being used in other places that, that isn't somewhere like Google. But yeah, anyone in the chat want to put anything you're excited? Recognition of cellular organelles from microscopic images. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so there, I've seen a lot of people do something like that. There's um, even a, I forget what it's called. There's a data set that is like a, you know, like an open source data set with something like that, that you could go and then label with the labeling tool if you want to have something cool to show. Uh, with like cells like that. I forget if, if you Googled um, cell data set or maybe it's maybe it was a blood cell data set and that might be a cool project for you to work on. So it's that artwork using GAN sounds exciting. It's really cool. Um, so I've done some GAN work. I think I have a little picture of something that looks like an, looks like art in a second that I'll show you. Uh, but GANs are really fun. There's something about generative deep learning that's really interesting because it's like creating something for you. Um, like artworks or original pictures of something, depending on the data set you gave it. Any other cool areas anyone wants to mention that they're excited about or they want to work in? Someone said, can you comment on what are major types of computer vision models used for these cases? Um, I will go a little bit into computer vision models in a second. And then if you want to go even deeper into other ones, because it, it, would, it really just varies on the problem that you're trying to solve for each of these. But I will talk about several major ones that are often used for these. So like uh, for different object detection methods or image segmentation. Cool, I will keep going. Those are all great to hear. Um, computer vision and deep learning. So computer vision isn't always tied to deep, to deep learning as a field, but in the past decade or so, uh, deep learning in the field of computer vision has really been dominating all the complex problems. So if you do see any interesting uh, news or startup doing something, uh, chances are it's using deep learning to do computer vision, but computer vision is kind of its own field uh, that's not always tied to it. And I just want to mention that because you can do a lot of great stuff um, 
just doing kind of image processing, like finding edges of objects and counting things. You can do that without deep learning if you have uh, pretty controlled environments. But deep learning works well for understanding uh, like objects much better and in different environments. So you're typically a bit more robust. Um, and then I'll share these links in the chat for you to check out later too, if you want. This kind of covers um, you know, what a deep neural network looks like. And this is a really good visualization of a convolutional neural network, which is one of the mo most popular ones uh, in computer vision. But at a high level, kind of how deep learning works and all you really need to know to kind of you know, go through this workshop is you have some sort of function and you could think of this as a mathematical function, you could think of it as a programming function. And essentially what we do is we feed a whole bunch of training data. And in our case here for most computer vision problems or a lot of computer vision problems, you're giving it a supervised data set or a labeled data set. So we would give it images and we'd say, what's in that image? So kind of the hello world of uh, a computer vision is often you train a classifier to recognize dogs and cats. And so you'd feed your model, the thing we're gonna train to understand patterns in our image, um, or in our images is uh, you would feed it images of cats and images of dogs and each image would have a label to it, right? Saying cat or dog. And then it would start extracting features of what makes up a cat, what makes up a dog. Maybe it's kind of the dogs have a much longer snout and like a bigger nose. Cats have much more triangular ears. Um, so you'd feed a whole bunch of data here and then you can check some parameters, which we'll see when we train our model to kind of, hey, make sure that you know, the accuracy is looking pretty good. And now we're going to feed a new piece of data that it's never seen before. So it would be a picture of a dog or a cat that the model had never seen. And then hopefully if the model was trained right, it would return a prediction correctly saying it's a cat or a dog. So it would look at a picture it never seen before, but it'd say, it would say it's most similar to these other images that I've seen and those were cats. So I'm gonna return a cat. Um, a quick note on transfer learning. So most popular deep learning frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Detectron2, um, you can load in pre-trained weights into your network. So you would define what model you wanna train. And then they have kind of pre-trained weights, which means they've been trained on things like thousands of images for I forget if it's hundreds or thousands of hours for a very long time. So they're actually pretty good at recognizing things generically sometimes where you can say, hey, you know, recognize dogs or humans. Um, and then you can adjust those weights though. So uh, uh, you, you take these pre-trained weights and then you say, okay, cool, you know a fair amount about the world, but now let's look at my specific thing that I wanna look for. So in this case, like we'll use a goose data set in this workshop and we'll say, hey, we wanna know uh, what is a goose and only what, what's a goose or, or whatever uh, your data set would be. And it turns out that taking these pre-trained weights actually works really good, even if you're training on a data set most of the time that, that maybe isn't similar to those pre-trained weights like humans or dogs. So just kind of think of it right now um, that you're not starting from zero. And that's how you'll see, we're going to train our model and it's only going to take several minutes and we're only going to use a, a, a pretty limited data set, but we're going to get really good results. And that's because of transfer learning. So a good rule of thumb too, starting out kind of just doing like a hobby project or something is uh, I kind of recommend trying to get 200 images or 200 object instances. So maybe you have 100 images and each image, image has uh, two objects that you're going to label. Uh, typically around 200 is good to start with to get some decent results. Uh, but if, depending on what your, your object is you're trying to recognize, you might need way more. Um, or it might do okay with less. So you can just kind of play around. You don't always have to get to 200, but it's kind of my kind of just general rule of thumb when I get started is I, I'll try to collect something like 200 instances before I train a model. So without transfer learning, it would probably take uh, thousands of images and a lot more time. So some types of computer vision. Uh, computer vision is a very big field, so we're gonna focus on uh, some computer vision with deep learning. And many of these types can kind of be combined together or uh, combined with another kind of algorithm on top to get various outcomes. And I'll kind of talk about this as we go. So classification, this is where most people are gonna start for computer vision. If you go through any other course that's kind of building up, you'll, you'll probably do this first and it will probably be something like training a cat or a dog classifier, something like that. Um, and classification is usually trained on a whole image uh, or a portion of an image. In this case, you know, this is trained on a, a dog breed data set. So it's just looking at this whole image and then you would feed it a new image that it never saw, it would make a prediction of the dog breed. 
object detection. So object detection can classify, but also localize where an object is inside of an image or a video. And this is what we're going to make today. And I'll cover how to make your own data set for this as well. And this is much more powerful because if you just do classification, you know, it doesn't know that there's only one dog in there. And if you had multiple dog breeds in here, it might get confused and make a prediction of just one of them. Maybe it's the one that's taking up most of the photo, but maybe you, you know, you want to know how many dogs were in this photo and how many dog breeds there were. So this does quite a bit more uh, right off the bat. So you can see it's drawing rectangles saying a goose is here in the image. And a goose is here in the image. And you can also do things like interaction between two objects, you know, kind of measure how close this goose is to the other one, um, how fast they're walking. You can track where they go, count them, all sorts of different things. So this is a really good foundation for starting to solve a lot of problems with computer vision. Image segmentation. Oh, someone asked, what does 100% mean? Is that the accuracy? Uh, in this case here, yeah, this is a, uh, um, it, because it, yeah, it, it, it's pretty confident in this case that it's a goose, so it's saying 100%. So if it wasn't very confident, and this is kind of rounded up, so it's probably really 99 point something something, um, that's its confidence. It's not necessarily accuracy because it could be pretty sure it's a goose, but maybe the model's wrong, uh, but that's its confidence score. So it's just saying, based on the data I was trained on, I'm very confident that this is a goose. Uh, all right, so image um, segmentation. So we kind of saw an example of this earlier with a truck. So not only are we drawing a box around the objects themselves, we're also measuring which pixels themselves belong to the object. So in this case, we have a water bottle and the water in the water that it's trained on. So you could actually do different things like measuring the overlap of water pixels to a bottle pixel and see how full it is, for example. So um, also doing image segmentation, even though it can be a little bit slower to run, um, often tends to be a bit more accurate. So if you're struggling making a really accurate data set, you might want to train for image segmentation and that might improve your accuracy. But it's really cool because now that you have these pixels that belong to an object, you can do kind of interaction between different objects on screen, which is really exciting. Feature point clustering. Um, so here we are measuring feature points. And in this case, oops, in this case, it's um, kind of doing a pose estimation. So you can see that there's kind of dots in all these different key places. So it's like a, a head, uh, where, where the eyes are, where a shoulder is, where elbows are and uh, feet and stuff like that. So you can, get, you can capture poses of people running or walking, measure how they are doing it. In this case, it's a, <laughs> this one is just kind of seeing what yoga pose they're in. Um, this is also common for facial features. So you can track moods by people, seeing where their mouths are, um, uh, what their eyes look like, anything like that. Image captioning. So you can label images with text. The Coco data set actually, I think, has this, I believe. And you can train kind of a combination of neural networks to understand a little bit more context around an image, which is interesting. So instead of just classifying, you know, there's a person on this beach and there's a kite and, and it's a beach or something like that. Um, it, it actually says, you know, child flying a kite on a beach because contextually that's what makes sense in the, in the image. GANs, here's an example. So someone was talking about making art with GANs and uh, I'll actually share this link in here. So this is a project I was working on with someone else. And we were generating um, new architecture images based on a famous architect. So we had a whole bunch of images from a designer and then we trained a GAN and actually made some kind of decent looking more like sketch drawing kind of 2D images of houses. And uh, this is actually during the training process, these don't look like houses at all, but I thought it looked like really cool art because before it even started looking like anything we were trying to get to, this just looked like really cool, like space art or something like that. And I just wanted to share a picture of it. So again, I think that uh, the generative kind of aspect of deep learning is really fun. And uh, uh, Williams, if you're interested in that, there's a really good book. I think it's just called Generative Deep Learning. And it goes step by step, like how to create GANs as well as some other things. And you, you might find that book really interesting. Like it, it gives you code to do it too. So you can 
you know, swap out their data set in the book for whatever other data sets you want. It's, it's really cool. So choosing a model, um, there can be a lot of uh, 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 many cases, or there can be a lot of factors to choosing models. And um, when you're when you're getting started, though, just really think about what is the problem you're trying to solve, and what outcome are you looking for. So if you just need to know, you know, how many things are in an image, maybe object detection is going to be fine, and you don't need this pixel kind of drawing over it. If you're doing interactions between objects, maybe you need pixels. Like in this case, you have this mouse and this piece of food. You know, we could have an algorithm on top saying, you know, if this pixel of the food is touching the mouse you know, classify it as eating or something like that. So a lot of different ways to think about it. And also deploying it can be a big thing. So we're not really getting into deployment here, but um, not all models are kind of like made equally to, to run on different platforms. So you can choose a really, really large uh, model architecture, which I'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, that might be super accurate, but it might run really slow if you're using a small device to run it, like on a Raspberry Pi with a, Coral TPU or Jetson Nano or something like that. So there's uh, some factors to that too. But I would say if you're just getting started and you're just you want to train models and learn from it, don't worry too much about it. Just kind of think about uh, you know what the problems you're trying to solve and what outcome you're looking for. And to do some of that the outcomes too, you don't actually have to draw it out like this. So I'll show you that when we get to the code, uh, you'll actually get stuff returned from a model and uh, you can make decisions based on there. So any questions real quick? I, we just, you know, we didn't really get into anything super technical yet, but just want to open it up for questions if anyone has any before we get into the object detection and uh, training. Oh, someone said, could I send them a link to that book? I don't think I heard it right. Oh, it's um, Generative Deep Learning. I'll just type the title in and you should be able to Google that and it's probably going to be the first result on Amazon or anything. Any other questions from anyone? Not, I'll just keep going. So object detection in a, oh, someone asked a question. How much data size do you need for training for object detection versus segmentation? So I, I kind of have that rule of thumb where you want like 200 uh, instances to get started, um, but it really depends on your type of data. So we'll see, like we're gonna train our object detector on a goose, the Canada goose in this case, and they all look very similar. So it's gonna learn very well on a limited number of images because they look very similar. But if you have an animal with a, a much wider range of looks, then you might struggle. So, you know, dogs look way different. So if I gave it 200 pictures of a dog, but every single picture was of a different type of dog, like a Chihuahua versus a German Shepherd, um, it might have a much harder time kind of learning the parameters of what make up a dog and what doesn't. So it really depends and often requires some experimentation when you're building out your model. But you don't really need, um, in my opinion, you don't necessarily need more for segmentation versus the object detection, but it will vary on your data. So um, I'll share more links when we get to the coding section too. At the end, there'll be all the links. So if you wanna learn about anything else, um, they will be in there, but um, uh, so object detection at a gist. So essentially what it does is it looks at an image, it finds some regions of uh, interest or proposed regions where it thinks an object might be. It then runs a classifier around the region and then kind of returns some data. And based on that, calculates the estimation of where the object is. So in this case, uh, just, I just kind of made these examples up here, but it'd be like, hey, I think something's around over here, runs a classifier, finds you know the most likely parts of uh, where a goose would be in this case, and then returns a bounding box for that. Um, and this does a really good kind of job of explaining how a lot of the algorithms work. And then I link to articles later that will go more in depth for specific ones as well. But just kind of a gist, that's what's happening. So here's some popular object detection methods. We have a single shot multi-box detector. It does uh, object detection, so like the bounty boxes, and it's very fast. It's usually pretty lightweight as well. So like I was saying, when you want to think about uh, deploying to something, if you're deploying to, let's say a Raspberry Pi, and, and sometimes on a Raspberry Pi, you might need some external hardware too, like a, a TPU or something to, to, to run a model on better. Um, I think even without it, it might be able to run this at a pretty low frame rate. 
but uh, single shot multi box detection tends to be a very light way to go. And then you can choose a model, a lighter weight model to train on, um, such as like mobile net. YOLO, you only look once. Um, it also does object detection and is pretty fast. There are several implementations of this and I haven't kept up with like the latest one I think just came out as version five and version four I think came out not too long ago. And I think they might be through by different developers now. Um, so I'm not sure the current benchmarks on version five versus SSD, but you might uh, wanna look at both of these. These are kind of the most popular just for like a, a lighter weight object detection. We have mask RCNN, a faster mask RCNN. So it can do object detection and image segmentation and tends to be uh, uh, more accurate, but a bit slower. And then we have this um, Facebook Detectron 2, and this is actually what we're going to use today. It's a really cool library by Facebook. Um, Facebook also makes and maintains a uh, PyTorch, which is another really popular deep learning library. But this library is kind of a, almost like a wrapper around PyTorch. And it allows us to do a lot of really cool things kind of baked in without a lot of setup. So here's a little video example showing this kitchen. You can see it can do object detection. So it's drawing boxes right around each object that it's trained on. And then here, let me just skip ahead. Uh, this is doing the, the feature points. So it's understanding you know, the pose. This is something called dense pose. So it actually draws a 3D kind of representation around them, which is really interesting. I've been seeing a lot of stuff you know, with like video games uh, using something like that to kind of capture movement and draw 3D characters out. And then here you can see it's doing the, um, the object segmentation. So it's drawing pixel by pixel where it thinks something's at. And then um, I forget what this is called. Uh, uh, oh, pe pe uh, panoptic um, segmentation. So instead of just drawing around all the objects, it's also drawing the background. So in this case, it's trained to see like this is cabinet, this is a wall, uh, even has wall tile. And if you run this on a data set that's like outdoors, like a self driving car or car data, you know, it'll paint it as like sky or uh, different types of cityscapes, which is really interesting. So it can be good if you want to add a little bit more, you know, context to where things are in the world potentially, which is really cool. So that's the library we're going to be using. And it's a, originally, I think, a fork of the mask RCNN. But it's really cool and it lets us get started uh, very fast. Um, so the full computer vision lifecycle. So we're going to cover the data annotation, labeling, and machine learning side of things. And a lot of times you kind of stay around in, in these fields when you're learning. Uh, particularly in machine learning, it seems like, from a lot of resources. Uh, but I did just want to mention, so you could think about this as you go, that often there's other stages to the entire kind of AI or, or machine learning or computer vision lifecycle. So often you have device management. You know, what are you going to actually be running your model on? How are you collecting data? Or, you know, if you have a camera stream that you're going to run your model on, those all need to be managed somehow. Data collection. So whether you're scraping the web for data or you're, you have a camera running and you're pulling uh, images or frames from that and then annotating those. You have the data annotation side. Then you have machine learning where you take your annotated data, feed it to your model. Um, then when it's, when it's done, then typically you want to deploy that somewhere so you, you can actually have it uh, solve your problem. So running a model you know, either in real time or close to, or depending on your solution, maybe it isn't real time. Um, but that's often running on an edge device or, or a cloud service. And in, in our case for computer vision, it's taking in images or camera stream and then kind of returning some sort of output to it. And oftentimes you kind of want to repeat this whole cycle. So it's called like continuous machine learning. And this is a, a often important for computer vision in uncontrolled environments. So kind of one example I always talk about, let's say you were detecting people walking into a store and all of your data uh, you captured in the summer. So people are wearing like t-shirts and shorts and maybe a baseball hat or something like that. And then you start have people come in uh, in the winter and they're wearing the coats and way different clothing. Well, your model might have only been trained to recognize people with specific clothing on and it might not be as accurate now that they've kind of changed clothing. Or one example too could be if you're detecting animals and you trained it on data that's all in the summer or spring with grass behind them and then all of a sudden it snows and your object detector is way off because it never saw animals in the snow before. It's throwing off your model somehow. So often if you're deploying in the real world and it's kind of an uncontrolled environment, you want to be collecting data throughout those uh, seasons and retraining your model with it. 
and not to be too salesy or anything, but we do have a really cool platform to do that all in one place. So if you know anyone looking, point into six skill, um, and you, you could also just email me at s at six skill.com, uh, or, or point someone to that, email. or if you just want to demo of it because it's really cool, let me know. All right. So, uh, some popular Python libraries, uh, for, uh use in computer vision. There are so many, just like in data science, you could go on a, a, a like a giant list. There's libraries to try to solve everything, but some really important ones that you'll probably want to be on the lookout for, or as you learn more about computer vision, you'll end up using, it's going to be PyTorch. Uh, it's a library from Facebook, like I mentioned. It's uh, for machine learning, really popular in deep learning. And then you have Tensor and uh, TensorFlow and Keras. That's uh, a library from Google for machine learning, very popular in deep learning. You'll kind of see people use either or one of these. Um, uh, often people will kind of stick with one because they, they know it well or they like writing in it better, but they kind of accomplish much of the same thing. So PyTorch and TensorFlow, most likely you'll use one of these on the back end somewhere. And like I was saying, uh, Detectron 2 actually uses PyTorch on the back end. And then we're going to use uh, 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 OpenCV. You'll almost all, always use this in some way of like uh, getting images or videos into your program to process. So you'll actually see we're going to use this today. NumPy uh, is great at processing multi-dimensional multi, uh, multi, multi arrays which is actually how computers see images. And we'll actually take a look at what an image looks like once it's loaded into Python. And then Pill or Pillow is another really popular image processing library. All right, any questions? We're gonna to get to the labeling portion and then we're gonna train a model. And uh, this won't take too much time here. So just wanna make sure any other questions before we get into the labeling. And I will share this again if you wanna sign up here. And please, um, again, you know, give it a try. Give me feedback on it. I'd love to hear it. If you build something like train a model like we're going, going to do today with your own data set, I would love to see it. It's always really fun. You can share it with me in the Slack or LinkedIn or tweet at me uh, anywhere you can find me. But did, did just want to pause. Um, any questions so far? We're about to get more into the hands-on stuff. We kind of went over some theory and applications. Just want to do a quick check-in. No questions. You're a, you're a quiet crowd tonight. Can you hear me? Looks like you're all still here. All right. <laughs> you can't hear me. <laughs> uh, everyone just doesn't have any, any questions. All right, that's fine. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, again, strongly encourage, go ahead and sign, this, uh, sign up for that so you can give this a try on your own. But I'm just gonna walk through some basics so that when you have your own data set, you will understand what to do. So once you sign up, um, use that promo code again, you'll get a lot of time for free. It'll uh, ask you to go click your confirmation email and then you'll have a screen like this. It won't have this uh, project already in here. So what you wanna do is create your own project. So you just hit create project. Give it a name. I'm just going to call this geese. I'm going to hit next. This is a really cool feature. Um, you probably won't really need to use it just for yourself if you're doing your own data set. Uh, but if you're working with multiple people um, and um, you want them to be able to label the data set, maybe they, they're not super knowledgeable about or something, right? Like if you're labeling certain tumors in the medical industry, like I wouldn't know what looks like a tumor and I would need someone to tell me. So what you can do is write really detailed uh, um, instructions here and you can even include images. So you could do images of a properly labeled example and images of a badly labeled example. So people know what to do and people know what not to do. So in this case, uh, I, I won't put any instructions here. Actually, I will. I'll say label all the geese with a rectangle label. And then this is something that people can bring up when they're labeling. So if they weren't sure what to do, they can look at these instructions. But if you want to skip it, just hit save and leave it blank. Here we have options to connect our data sources. So in this case, just images that we want to label. And we can easily connect to Amazon S3 buckets or Google Cloud Storage, both popular spaces to store images. In this case, though, I'm just going to upload some local assets. So I'm going to hit add asset. And I'm just gonna, just gonna load a, a quick example. 
here's the proper one. All right. So I'm just going to upload a couple of these here. Just select, you know, all the ones you want to upload. And then I will hit open. And I might have, uh, I was messing around with data sets earlier, so I might have done something dumb. Or if this does happen and you know your image is fine, um, just hit upload again on that specific image. I'm going to go ahead and add another one real quick. I know GCP has been a little funny lately too, so I don't want to point out problems for someone else, but all right, so those uploaded. So we have a few images. Um, again, typically if you're creating your own data set, you will want to have way more than you know, four or five images. I'm just doing this for an example, so we're not going to spend an hour labeling data. I just want to show you kind of each step. So you can see here too, the, our total count of images is four, and you can um, upload in, you can mix data sources. So if you had Amazon S3 and local files, you can add them all here. We also have this little uh, search a, a functionality. So you can put in a search term and uh, uh, hit search and it'll return some data sets from like an internet search and you can start building a data set that way too. So I'm gonna hit label schema. So this is where we define our labels that we want to um, label in our data set. So I'm going to hit add label. I'm going to say goose because we're going to be labeling some geese. And I'm going to leave this as a rectangle because this is what we want for object detection. But I'm going to change this color. This color is really just for you um, during the labeling process because I know that my geese are on green grass. It might be hard to see this green label. So I'm going to go give it a nice uh, um, kind of brighter color, this pink. And then um, hit save. And now for this example, just so I, I can show you how to do the image segmentation portion as well, I'm going to make another one uh, just for goose polygons. And then here, you would change this to whatever label type you want. So polygons is kind of drawing around an object we'll see in a second. We also support things like feature point classification and text. So I'm going to hit save. And now we have two labels here. And then I'm going to hit start labeling. And this brings up some images. So to label for object detection, all we need to do is draw that rectangle around it. So just select your label on this panel here and rectangle, rectangle, done. Um, so <laughs> I kind of went fast here and for kind of the, the, like a, a hobby type problem, you don't need to be, you know, super accurate, but typically you want to be kind of as close to the object as possible. So I added a, a lot of room here. Uh, what we want to do is make this as close as possible. And then when our model is learning from our data, it's going to look at just what's in here and um, extract features. So we want to really just have as close to the goose as possible. And it's going to learn kind of what a goose looks like better than if we have large bounding boxes. Okay, good. Oh, I'm going to hit uh, submit down here. Or if you hit next, it'll say, hit, uh, we'll say save and submit. Go ahead and label these ones. And so you just want to do this in uh, all of your images. One thing to note uh, that's pretty important. So if I am labeling an instance in an image, I want to label all of them, at least all of them that are pretty close to the camera. So in this case, right, if I only labeled these geese, or as a, maybe a better example, um, let's say I only labeled one goose and I'm training my model. Well, it would look in here, try to extract the features of what makes up a goose. But as it's learning, it would also look here and say, well, they, they said this wasn't a goose because they didn't label it. So I'm actually not sure. Like this looks very similar to this thing. And it'll probably struggle with uh, learning what your object is if you don't label everything. So some caveats on that is like if the goose is really far in the background and you're OK with your model not recognizing it that far away, then maybe you don't need to label it. But you do want to make sure you label all the instances in your image um, as much as possible. So here I would want to label these ones too because I'd want them to be recognized. And then hit submit. Done. And then um, to do polygons, so if you're going to do an image segmentation where you want to train the model to kind of draw those pixels around the actual image, um, typically what you do is you label with a polygon and the polygon labeling is just like this. So you kind of draw around the goose. I'm going to go very fast here. So this will be a very poor drawing. Uh, you typically want to be as kind of like with um, 
the bounty boxes as close to the goose as possible. So it can help as you're doing this, you know, you can zoom in, um, you can take your time doing it. It can take, you know, much longer than a rectangle, uh, labeling with a rectangle, because you have to draw around each spot, especially if you have a really complicated shaped, um, you know, animal or something like that. Again, I'm doing a terrible job right here, but I just want to show you what that looks like. Um, and then you collect, connect this kind of last node together and you can zoom in. Uh, a nice feature too is you can hit escape that'll kind of unselect the label um, and then you can click on the labels and then adjust them. So you can actually come in, and kind of tighten this up a lot if you wanted to. Um, but a really cool feature is that, you know, drawing a polygon kind of takes a lot of time. So you can hit this little button here and this enables something called smart poly or smart, smart polygon selection. And it gives you this bounding box tool. And then you draw a bounty box around the object that you want it to select. And then boom, it snaps to it. And it does a pretty good job on a lot of um, uh, object types. Sometimes you'll notice maybe it just doesn't work perfectly. And what you want to do in that case, uh, hopefully it gets you like 80 or 90% of the way there. And what you want to do is then adjust those points just like we did before, um, but it's much quicker this way. So let's say that this wasn't perfect. This is actually really good on this example, but let's say that um, it wasn't perfect and I want to kind of draw this out more. You know, you just go in and hit these points. If you click these kind of grayed out ones that actually create new nodes. So if you want to get really precise on anything, um, you can do that here. So that's a real big time saver if you're labeling for image segmentation. It's awesome. We'll hit submit on that. And then what we want to do once we're done labeling, so let's just say we labeled all these images. Hit submit there. Is we want to export our labels so we can use them in a, a machine learning model. So we'll go to this review tab. And you don't really have to do anything in here unless you're working with a team. It's a really nice collaboration feature where you can go in and review each image and then hit approve where you hit submit. Um, or you can do bulk approving. So you could select all these and then you say, yes, these all looked good to me. I'm gonna hit approve because whoever you had labeling it did a good job labeling it. But if you're just labeling everything yourself for your own project, you probably don't wanna go through that extra process of hitting approve. So um, when you hit export, just make sure that you check this little box here that you could, you're um, exporting submitted annotations as well as like your approved annotations. So this is made so that um, if you have people labeling, but you didn't go through and approve all those things yet, you, you just wanna do the approved ones that you know are good, you can export those. So I'm gonna select this submitted annotation right here. And then here are the, the common label types for computer vision. So you might have seen some of these before if you've dabbled a little bit. We have Create ML, that's kind of Apple's machine learning ecosystem. We have Coco, which is a really popular format for your data set. YOLO and Pascal VOC, all these are pretty common. And so if you are training a model and you're not using Detectron 2, the thing we're gonna use today, you'll probably select one of these other ones um, or, or it might also support Coco, but potentially it'll have Pascal VOC or something like that. And what this is, is um, this is just a way of putting your model in a, for, uh, putting your data in a format for your model to read. So we'll look a little, we'll look into this a little bit later uh, when we bring it into our model, what it looks like. But essentially it just makes like a JSON file or an XML file and it has a URL to the image and then it has, uh, you know, the bounding boxes or the polygon drawing uh, coordinates. So, so when the model trains, it'll look just in that square. And then you also have this nice option. If you've done any machine learning before, you probably know that you want to train, test, split your data. Um, in deep learning, you often have three data sets. Training, so this is the data that we're going to pass to our um, model to learn from. And then we're going to save 10% of our data to test on after it's done training. And then uh, there's something called a validation data set. This is really nice because as you're training your model, it's, uh, ac it's training accuracy is almost always going to go up. But um, you want to make sure that it's still going to generalize well to data that's never seen before. So as we're training, um, in our case today, we're going to look every 50 cycles and have it run on a validation data set that it's never seen before, just to make sure that it does seem like it's doing a good job of classifying our object as it's training. So I kind of think of the validation data set um, kind of a, as the training data set before the human in the loop. 
because as you train your model, you might need to adjust some parameters like learning rate or different things like that. And you can use the validation data set to, to kind of do that and make sure that it's working well. Um, and then you, once, uh, once you've tuned your model with the hyperparameters and it's trained, then you want to test it on a test data set that you didn't use to tune it and the model didn't use to learn from. So you just want to export now. I'll say export completed. And uh, in a second, you'll get a notification here. So it can, uh, it can take a while if you have a very large data set, uh, just as it exports, it's usually not too long. And you'll get a notification here and it'll also give you an email. And then you would just hit this download link on your email and it'll download your data set here as a zip file. And uh, we'll take a look at in a second in the code. Um, it's going to be a folder of um, images and then three JSON files, one for the train, one for the test and one for the split or for the validation data set, sorry. Um, but yeah, just make sure that it's gonna be in the right format. So if you're, you're doing Coco or a generic, uh, we have this uh, generic JSON kind of, so if for whatever reason uh, your model doesn't take any of these, you can always use JSON and then use like a Python script to get it in the format that you need for your model. So I'm gonna catch up on questions real quick. Someone said, so are there any different data file types? Coco, YOLO, Pascal. So uh, the, the file type is usually JSON or XML, but it's the format that they're laid out on. So we'll take a look at it when we get to the code and we're gonna import this data set. Um, it's just that they're laid out in a different way and models expect things to be a certain way when they read it in, if that makes sense. Any questions on labeling? It's pretty easy if you have a good tool for it, um, which not every tool is super easy to use. Uh, it's especially nice having these like export features. It's nice having everything stored in one place kind of in the cloud. If you're doing image segmentation, that smart poly polygon feature is awesome. Oh, one, one quick note here. Um, so by default, this little filter down here always goes to pending images. So if you labeled all of your images, um, you'll just want to come back and you can either filter by like submitted, all images, pending, skipped. So uh, this could be useful if you're reviewing images for someone, you want to hit approve on everything, but not all the images are labeled. You can hit, you know, filter by submitted and then just go through, review all the annotations and hit approve. So instead, would this also work for videos as well? Yes. So the um, right now, the convert video to frame feature isn't in here yet, but it's coming very soon. Um, you can also use Python scripts or any other tools to convert a video to frames and then upload those to here right now. But that feature is coming very soon where currently we only support image types. So if you're setting up um, it, uh, a source here, you'll just want to select images. Uh, but soon you'll be able to select a, a video and then a there will be an option because usually videos have certain uh, uh, frame rates per second. And so it'd be like, hey, like this is 30 frame rates per second. Do you need all 30 per second or are you okay with like one or two? You would say how many uh, frames per second that you want to be added into the labeler. So that, that feature is coming soon. It's just, it isn't in here right now. So it said, will videos need to be trained frame by frame? So a lot of times, yes, there's different ways of doing it, but typically a lot of times you'll break a video into frames like this and then label kind of each frame, um, you know, where in this case, where the goose is. But we have a really cool feature coming very soon. Uh, we're calling it track forward. So this, let me just make this a little bit bigger. Um, so this, this isn't in the UI yet. So this example though, here's a tennis player. And track forward, what it does is you can label the first instance of the object that you want to label. And then it'll kind of do an object tracking uh, on that object to the next frame. So let's say you imported a video and you want to label a whole bunch of frames, uh, but you don't want to spend the time labeling it. So you would label the first one and then the next frame would go, you would turn on that track forward feature and uh, it does a pretty good job of tracking like where the object moved to if it's a different pose you know, it's snapping polygons to it. So this is gonna be one of those things too, that's like a huge time saver. Um, that's one thing we're coming out with is kind of a lot of AI assisted labeling features because labeling data just isn't super fun. I mean, you can kind of get in a rhythm, put on some good music or a podcast, 
uh, but having a computer actually do the labeling for you is amazing. Um, so some other features coming out pretty soon will be like auto labeling. So it can be trained on classes and you, you could be like, hey, label all the humans, label all the birds in this image, and it would uh, try to find those and label those for you. So a big time saver. Um, any other questions on labeling? Just pause here. It's a, a really important part of computer vision and you know most kind of deep learning. But I feel like it's skipped over in almost uh, all resources I've ever gone through for computer vision. So, and, and these apply to, right? Like uh, the concept of labeling boxes and stuff. If you do use some other open source labelers or something like that, you know, think of all the different concepts I described here. Like you wanna have the, the boxes tight as possible. You wanna label all those instances. Someone asked, does six skill have any labeling for 3D images like MRI? So we don't have that in our tool yet too. Um, but that's a, um, I'm not sure where that is on the roadmap, but I know it's a feature we've been discussing adding. So for 3D labeling, you have things like uh, MRI and also LIDAR is often in 3D points as well. I know there are other tools for that though. Any other questions on labeling before we get into the code? So someone said, just curious, how did people do labeling before these types of programs? <laughs> um, great question. I don't know because, uh, I, you know, in my career, there's always been some sort of labeling tool, even if it's like a, not a great labeling tool. So it's so much easier if you have a great kind of interface like this and like everything saved in one spot and all these cool features. Like there's a open source tool that I've used a lot um, and it, it works. It's just not great, you know, and it might take a lot more time. So I think like that, people probably wrote um, very simple uh, um, programs where you essentially are drawing lines. So really you just need to capture, right? Like where, where this box is, the coordinates of where this box is. So you could write a Python program or something to do this for you, uh, but it probably won't be nearly as nice. And if you wanna bring up instructions, you just hit this little instruction pane. So we see I put in the instructions of uh, label all the geese with a rectangle label. So when Sash asked, should we initially train label images from as many perspectives or, uh, uh, as possible, or should we try to use roughly the same orientation? That's a great question. So yeah, if, if you know what perspective or like uh, form that your object is gonna be in, you, if, and you have the ability of capturing that, you should definitely put that in your training data. So here, right, the, these geese are in all different positions. This will help your model learn a lot because if you only train the model on geese that look like this position, and then you showed a pictures of this geese from behind, uh, it might not have learned really what they look like. So you really wanna think about um, what are all the variations that my, um, my object might be in. And that also goes for environment. So even though you're drawing these boxes around it, it's still learning to extract these features from kind of a green background environment. So if the background then changed to be snow, which I don't think the geese hang out in snow, it might have problems uh, recognizing that this is a goose. If it was only trained on this data. And I actually did a talk on that previously. And that's actually, if you look at this whole data set, when we go through the code, there's uh, images of geese like Photoshopped into like my living room and stuff. And that's actually because the point of the talk was talking about how that is a problem. Like if you only train in one environment like this and then switch to a whole different environment that it was never trained. And even though they're this like kind of same pictures of the geese or same variations of geese had uh, trouble recognizing them because it just never saw them, them in the living room or it would recognize something like my chair as a goose or something because it wasn't trained that, that a chair wasn't a goose. It only saw kind of stuff in the park. So that's something to think about too. Um, if you know that there's gonna be baby geese around, but you don't wanna have them classified as a goose, you'd wanna make sure that they're in your de data set somewhere if possible and then not labeled as a goose. Great question. Yeah, so you'll learn a lot too as you go through and kind of train your own models of how to collect better data, how to have, have more variations. Um, and that, that in itself is a skill. Any other questions? And again, one more time, I'll just share this link and promo code. 
And again, if you have feedback, we'd love to hear it. Or if you build something awesome, I'd love to, love to see it too. All right, um, so let's get into the code. I'm gonna share this link. So you wanna click on this. This will bring you to a Google Colab notebook. And then you wanna save your own copy in a drive. Um, and so remember, just depending where your background is, uh, um, it's okay if something doesn't make sense. Uh, computer vision is complicated. Programming is complicated. Um, getting errors are awesome. They're trying to tell us what to fix, so don't panic. Uh, hopefully we won't really get any crazy errors. Uh, but if you do, don't worry. Um, and then you don't need to memorize everything. Just try to remember kind of the high level concepts as we go. So you can like look those things up, go back through the code, pick it apart more yourself um, kind of with more time. Main thing is just be awesome to yourself and others. So everyone has a different background and learning style. Right, I'm gonna open this up as well. So everyone should click on this link and you should come up to a page like this. Does, did this come up for everyone? Okay, I'm seeing yeses. And what you want to do is hit file, save a copy in drive. And this can take a minute. And you should get this new tab. Sometimes uh, it'll ask you, it might have a pop-up saying, you know, your copy is ready. Do you want to see it or something like that? So did people save a copy in their own drive? Very important, just so you can run all the code. And this is also your own copy. So you can mess with the code in here. Um, you can do whatever you want to it. If you really, really mess it up to the point of like, uh, you want to restore it back to the original version, you can just save that link that I posted in the chat or bookmark it or something. So you can always come back to this place and make your own uh, copy again. All right, so this is Google Colab. Colab is um, essentially Google's way of, of hosting a Jupyter Notebook. It's a really popular tool used in data science. It's a cool way of kind of doing coding, documentation, and visualization kind of all in one place, which is super nice. Um, and if you want to edit the text area, you just kind of double click here, brings up this format. You can write in Markdown. Um, to get out of this mode, hit Shift Enter, and I'll go back to this kind of formatted mode. A cool thing about Google Colab, you don't have to change anything right now because you made a copy from mine, but if you're creating a very uh, a new Google Colab and using it for deep learning, you'll probably want to use a GPU hardware, hardware accelerator uh, because uh, deep learning uh, uses a GPU or a TPU typically to, to train models or even run models on. If you don't have this selected and it's just using a CPU, it's going to take so long to train your model probably. So just make sure if you're doing something with deep learning, you can go to runtime and uh, change runtime type, but you don't need to do change anything right now. But I do just want to show that's here in case you create your own Google Colab in the future. It's a really cool way of uh, getting into deep learning if you don't have a GPU at home, because um, I know for me, that was a problem for a long time and I wanted to train models. They give you for free, I think something like 12 hours a day of uh, GPU time, which is really great. And then if you want, you can buy a pro version. I think it's like $10 a month or something. And I think they give you like 24 hours or something like that of running a, a GPU. It can vary what GPU they give you. So sometimes you'll get a really good one and everything's gonna be super fast. Sometimes you get uh, one that isn't quite as good and it might be a little bit slower. That's just kind of the downside of uh, using this free GPU service, but it's really, really cool and uh, can open up kind of the possibilities of deep learning and computer vision for people who don't have a GPU at home. So this is a, a code cell. And to run this, you can hit this little play button or you can hit shift enter. So a lot of times I hit shift enter. So we, if you don't see me hitting play, I'm hitting shift enter. And I'm gonna go ahead and run this. The first time you run a code cell, it's going to connect to an instance. And uh, it, that can take a minute. Once you run your first code cell, it should stay connected and everything should execute much faster. So did everyone run a code cell? It says, hello world. You can change this text in here if you want. If you've never done, done Python, uh, the print function is kind of the output into, uh, or it kind of outputs the text that you put in there. People are saying yes. Oh, someone said, no, send me a link, just join, no worries. Uh, the link is right here. And if anyone else joins in late and asks for the link, if, if someone else wants to have that available to paste, that'd be really cool. But uh, you joined at a perfect time. So uh, we already covered image labeling, which it talks a little bit more in here. Uh, but you can also 
uh, um, we're, we're just getting to the code. So everything, everything should work for you as we go. All right, so if you hit this uh, run and, and that worked, awesome. We're ready to run all the other commands and I'll walk through what we're gonna do. Uh, one, one cool thing to note is uh, if you're familiar with bash or like terminal commands in Linux or anything, you can actually run those in Google Colab because it's a little bit more than just a Jupyter Notebook. It's a whole kind of uh, Ubuntu instance that you're running in. So if, uh, LS is list directory if you're already familiar with that. Um, but to run the, run the command, you want to put this little um, exclamation point at the beginning. So if I say ls, it's going to list all the folders in the directory. Um, don't worry if you're not familiar with uh, bash commands or anything. We don't really need them, but it's, uh, it's really cool to be able to do things like that right in these code cells. So the first thing we want to do is install Detectron 2 and all of its dependencies. So a cool thing about Google Colab is it also comes pre-installed with a whole bunch of libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, most of the major data science ones. It doesn't have uh, Detectron 2 pre-installed, but it does have a lot of the dependencies. So this will be really fast installing all these libraries. I have this cell, we're going to run it. This is saying pip install. Uh, pip install, if you've never used Python before, is a way of installing libraries. Um, kind of into your Python directory so you can use them. So in here, we're installing Torch, which is a PyTorch 1.7. And uh, CUDA, or CU 101, or CUDA, is a way of interacting essentially with a GPU. So we just want to install the version of CUDA that PyTorch can talk to our GPU to train models on. And then Torch Vision is a library for PyTorch and computer vision version 0.8.1. Uh, uh, and you can see it says uh, requirements already satisfied. The reason why I have this in here is because if you ever come back to this and Google Colab updated their version of PyTorch to 1.8 or something, it might break the installation of Detectron 2. So um, this will just install everything if you come back to this later and it's a little bit outdated. Here we're gonna install some other libraries, PyAML and PyCoco tools because we're gonna use the Coco data set. Some other dependencies for uh, Detectron 2, essentially. And then here we're going to install Detectron 2. We're running this little test beforehand because this version of Detectron 2 specifically is made for PyTorch 1.7. And if you didn't run that cell above and they updated to 1.8 or something, it might throw some sort of error at us later. So it's really just doing kind of a, a check. Um, and you can see that most of the, the, of the requirements are already satisfied and it's already done installing. And I just want to note, so this little warning down here um, it says like you must restart runtime to use these newly installed versions. Don't worry about that. Uh, we actually don't need to do that here. Um, here I'm going to install a um, correct version of pill or pillow because I think uh, we need this one for it to run as well. And again, don't worry about the, that error or yeah, the warning. All right, and then here, if you've never used Python, uh, you're kind of importing libraries that you have installed so you can use them in your program. So we're importing Detectron 2, some other various Detectron 2 portions that you'll see we will use as we go. And then some other common libraries like NumPy I talked about to do kind of array processing. Um, CV2 is OpenCV. And uh, as a quick note on Google Colab and actually in Jupyter Notebooks in general, OpenCV often breaks if you use like the mshow function, which is like showing an image. So Google actually has their own like version of that function implemented. So we can actually output an image with OpenCV, but it's gonna say uh, CV2 underscore mshow instead of the, the common one. If you installed this on your own local machine or something, it would say uh, CV2 dot mshow, I believe. So hit run. And uh, I think there's a new version of something, but don't worry, it's just saying in the future, we might need to update something here. Uh, but did this work for everyone? Because if this worked and everything installed, if you did not get an error, which you shouldn't get an error as long as you run for all these code cells, um, if you skipped one, you might get an error somewhere. Uh, but did this work? Did people get the, the libraries installed and then imported? If so, then hopefully we shouldn't have any issues going forward. But I always like to check because occasionally something might have happened up front. Adam said, work fine. Awesome. Adam's always on it to communicate. I love it. Thank you. All right, cool. Um, if you do have any issues, uh, let me know. So creating a data set, we already walked through this. For anyone who just joined, though, you can sign up for the data set annotation. Use this promo code. But don't worry, uh, we already went through this. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and download in here this uh, Git repo is a, a pre-labeled data set. So it has way more images than, than those four that we just did. 
And then I'll talk about um, a couple ways that you could get your own data set into Detectron or into uh, Google Colab, because there's gonna be a couple of different ways to do it. All right, so we have our data set. You can see it downloaded, um, our data set, and we have a folder with images, and then we have the test, train, and validation JSON files. And these are all the images here. So now we're going to take that data set and um, import it. And so a, a, a thing to note, so I'm using this GitHub because it's really easy doing a workshop uh, to have someone just click these commands and get a data set in their notebook. But typically if you're, you have your own data set and you did the export, you probably like maybe you want to store it on GitHub, um, but sometimes you, you probably won't want to do that. So if you just have it locally, there's a couple ways of getting in here. So you can hit this tab over here. There's some options. This folder option will kind of show all the files and it shows all the folders in your uh, Colab instance. And we can see here's our folder of goose data. Cool. So there's a couple ways of doing this. You could go find the, the data set that you, um, that you want and then just kind of click and drag it into here. So when we had that um, folder got downloaded, uh, we would unzip it and then we would just drag all those files into this instance and I'll just automatically upload them here. The problem with that is every time you restart the instance, like I was saying how you have 12 hours of training time or something, um, or if you restarted this or you, you, you did some training and then you came back or something like that, um, potentially Google could have disconnected you and then you'd have to re-upload those files. So an easier way of always having your data set kind of available to do training on is you can mount to Google Drive. So you can hit this little icon, mount drive and connect to Google Drive. And some of you may have used Google Drive before. I know I've used it for quite some time, but it's just a way of being able to you know, upload your files or images or anything like that in the cloud or using Google Docs or Google Sheets. And now we have this drive folder here. And this actually goes to my entire Google Drive. So now I can have a folder. I have this uh, ML one and I have some like just some examples I was playing around with. I had uh, like a candy thing I was working on detecting candy. And I have a data, my Coco data set in here. So you can see there's my image folder. And in this case, I just had a one JSON file. So what you'd want to do probably is go to your Google Drive, create a folder for like data sets or your data set, and then upload all those things here. And then there's some paths that will change here if, if you do that in this case. So here we're going to register our data set. And because we saved in that Coco format, it actually makes it really easy in Detectron 2 because they have this register Coco instances um, kind of function. And we pass it a name. So we're calling this my data set train. And then we have to pass it to where our JSON file lives. So we have the train validation and test one. And remember those live in our goose data set folder here. But if you're using your own data set, um, you'd want to navigate to where it is in here. Just as an example, um, let's go back to that candy one. I would navigate in here. I would then find my um, uh, JSON path. And then you can just hit copy path and paste it here. So it actually makes it really easy because you can just copy it. And then if you were to come back and restart your whole collab or anything like that, and as long as it mounts to your drive or you hit mount to your drive, it'll automatically find it again. So once you do this and you're going to come back to this multiple times, uh, your data set's essentially just always saved there for you to train on. So really convenient, but a little bit harder to do during a workshop because everyone has different Google Drive setups and stuff. But just wanted to point that out. Um, and it might seem really complicated going through all those steps, but once you do it once or twice, it'll actually be really easy. And you just want to do it in all these kind of path scenarios. So in this case, uh, this path here is looking into this folder above this uh, image data set. And then we're going to do this again for validation and then test. So go ahead and run this and it's okay. That was a lot to take in. Um, I think that's actually just one of the more complicated parts is getting your data into it before we can train. Is everyone okay with that? Um, I can always come back to this uh, more if you want to ask any other questions later too. All right, so we um, registered our data sets and now let's um, make sure that our data set came in correctly. 
you always want to do this because you never know if you did something wrong at some point. Um, so I've done this a lot in the past and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, why isn't my model working or anything like that? Ended up that somewhere in my importing the data, um, I did something stupid and it was like reading my rectangles backwards. So instead of actually being around the goose, it was something like over here and the model just couldn't figure out what I was trying to do. So my rule <laughs> for sure is every time I, uh, um, uh, register my data set or import my data set into my code. I always want to print it out and see what it looks like. So in this case, it looks correct, right? Like it's drawing around geese correctly. And like I mentioned before, this data set, uh, there's a whole talk around it of kind of putting geese in situations that weren't in the park. Um, so that's why you'll see some that are Photoshopped. They might look a little bit funny. But here what we're saying is uh, we're getting some, of, of, we're making a variable, getting some metadata from our training set. So really just getting like this class of goose. Um, and we're creating a variable called data set dictionaries. And then we're saying essentially just for, hey, three random samples. If we run this, it'll be three random other images from our data set. Got one of the same ones. So you can run this a couple of times. These cute baby geese. As I was taking these photos, the geese had babies. It was really fun to see. And then we're reading in that image with OpenCV, this mread function. We're getting that file name from, uh, we're essentially saying for each file, in that, that data set dictionary, which we'll look at what this looks like in a second. And then you um, see this kind of built-in visualizer function from Facebook Detector on 2. This just makes it easy to plot out these graphs. So don't worry too much about it. You will see this weird looking thing. That's actually because there's a thing with OpenCV. Um, it reads in images with blue, green, red, I believe. And most other computer vision or uh, image processing libraries are red, green, blue. Like you've probably seen RG RBG channels and uh, RGB channels and uh, in OpenCV is kind of backwards. So it'll read in an image, read in the reverse channels. And this is just kind of reversing that array. So if you see this in this case, um, that's what it's doing. It looks crazier than it is. And then we're just um, kind of getting our visualizer output. We're going to look at this some more as we do some similar stuff. So don't worry if this is a lot. Uh, but I think if you go back here, you can kind of pick this out a little bit what's happening. And then here's our uh, Google Colab mshow function. That's actually what's plotting out the, the images here. Um, here's what the data set dictionary looks like. So when we read in that the Coco data set file, we get a whole bunch of data uh, about our images or about our data set. So you can see that um, it's just a giant dictionary and essentially has a URL for each image and then has some other parameters around them and ID, like what's their width and height. And then also has the bounty box location. So you can see that there's four um, data points here and that's what's drawing right, these rectangles around. And that's the portion that our model is gonna look at and learn from. All right, so training our model. Um, let's go through this quickly. And then as it's training, I'll open up for questions again. <clears throat> So I'm gonna go ahead and run these two cells because it can take a few minutes. So you should do this too if you're following along and then I'm just gonna come back and talk about what they're doing. So let me just make sure that this starts. This is, this is, this cell is actually doing the training. So you're gonna be uh, training your computer vision model as soon as this runs. Okay, cool, I'm getting some output. I'm gonna scroll up and talk about what's happening. I also have some notes in here. So if you wanna review like the actual Detectron 2 docs, um, that's in here. There's something called a model zoo. And this is where, when I was talking about choosing models, you can actually go in and select different ones. So in this case, we are going to be using one called uh, um, Coco detection. So it's taking a Coco data set and it's doing object detection, not the segmentation. And we're using a faster RCNN um, and it says 101. That's kind of the larger version of it. So if this model's too big essentially for whatever you need to deploy on, you can find there's some smaller ones in there like a 50. Um, and some other smaller ones, but there's also like, I talked about single shot multi-box detection and mobile net and stuff a little bit before. You can go look at this model zoo and find what's gonna work best for your uh, application. When you get to that point, if you want to kind of explore different things. Uh, but this is important to note. So we have this part where we're saying we want this model and I'll talk about, more, I'll talk about this more in a second, um, but you would change this to something like this uh, that's a image segmentation example, if you're doing image segmentation. So if you labeled your data with polygons and you wanna do that image segmentation in your video or images, you would just swap this uh, kind of model architecture out with this segmentation one. 
All right, so um, this is kind of a, a little bit weird here because um, Detectron 2 doesn't have an easy built-in way to do validation as you're training your model, which is a little bit annoying, but it's pretty easy to get around. There's this medium post here, which I may, uh, recommend checking out. They talk more about kind of what's happening here and how to do this, but they also go into depth of how to do other types of evaluation uh, or validation as you're training. And we're using kind of a simple one, which we'll see in a second. So this is just kind of creating our own class here. And uh, again, this is in the Detectron 2 documentation for something called build, uh, a build evaluator. And what this is really doing is just kind of feeding our um, evaluation data set into our model as it's being trained. And we'll see the output of that in a second. So here, this is how you set up a, a, a Detectron 2 model for training. We have this kind of config um, variable. I think they call it a config node. And then we kind of add some stuff to it. So we're saying config.merge from file, model zoo, get config file. So we're passing it this. Again, you can look at that model zoo link and see all the different types of models you want in there. But in this case, we're going to use a faster RCNN with a, a ResNet 101 and uh, a train for object detection. Then we're going to pass it a, a training data set. So remember up top when we registered our data sets with register Coco data set, we trained our, or we named our training one my data set train. And don't forget this comma at the end. If you don't have this comma at the end, it'll throw an error and it might take you a long time to troubleshoot. Um, so if you get an error and you've changed some stuff in here, that could be why. The reason why is it's expecting a tuple data type, which is an object type in Python. And if it's not in there, then it's, I think, just a string and it throws an error. I think it might be so you can pass up multiple training data sets. Then you have some other parameters. If you've done any deep learning before, a lot of these will look a little bit familiar. So if, if you aren't familiar with these um, and you go through some other resource, you'll probably be like, ah, that's what that thing was doing if you didn't understand it here. Um, num workers is a thing in PyTorch. So you can adjust this for kind of multi-process uh, loading. You don't need to worry about that right now, but it's an optimization thing if you're getting more into like the nitty gritty of uh, uh, PyTorch for kind of scaled machine learning. And then this is important. So if you do change this up here to something like image segmentation, you also want to change this down here. And what this is doing is, remember when we talked about transfer learning, this is saying, hey, we, we have our model architecture up here that we know we want to use. Um, and there are weights included for that if we want to do transfer learning. So this will make it easy for us to do um, our own object detection model with very little data and very little time. Otherwise, it would uh, start from zero and it probably wouldn't function well on the amount of data we have. And then here uh, we have images per batch. So how many images are you going to feed in per batch? Again, you don't really have to worry about this too much, uh, but there are kind of parameters you can look more into later. Learning rate, this can, can be important if your uh, model just isn't learning well from your data. This is something you can adjust up and down, uh, but this will probably work pretty well for any type uh, or a lot of uh, data types kind of for your hobby project. But again, you can read more about learning rates and how they affect how deep learning learns um, and play around with this. This is important. This is something that you might want to adjust. Um, this is saying we're going to look at our data set in its entirety about 300 times and learn from it. This is something you probably want to move up. Um, if your data set has more variations or um, is much more complicated than a goose, you'll probably want to do something like over 300 iterations. But in this case, because the geese are pretty similar looking, we'll actually get really good results with, with 300 iterations of looking at that data. But um, you'll actually see, I think, when we look at some of the output, that we, if we had more, our model would probably get even better. So this is something like you could definitely play with in increasing. Um, you could go to 500, 1,000. It just depends on your data type. And that's one of those things that as you build models, you'll kind of learn about how to adjust this for your data. Um, this is just kind of saying how many um, instances per image we're going to look at. Again, uh, don't worry about this, but if you do have a uh, maybe an image and with like 100 instances or something, this could be a parameter you want to mess around with. And then this is very important. So if you're cha uh, training your own data set and let's say you have two classes you want to detect, like uh, a goose and a duck, or you're trying to detect uh, people and bikes or something like that, you want to have whatever the number of classes are in your data. So, so in our case, we only had geese and we would leave it at one. But if we are doing goose and duck, we would do two. If you're doing goose, duck, pigeon, that would be three. 
this is making a new directory. So this just made our output folder here. And this is actually saving our model and everything during training in this folder. And then here, um, this is saying every 50 cycles of looking at our data set, run our uh, model on that validation data set and uh, give us an output. So as we train, we'll look at this output. We can actually see, hopefully, that our model is improving over time on the validation data set and not getting worse. If it's getting worse or just not working, something's wrong somewhere. Um, and you'll probably want to either adjust some hyperparameters, make sure that your data is being read correctly, or maybe you need more data for training for it to generalize better on images that it hadn't seen. So here we're going to look at output. This is. Um, Someone asked me what is going on with Model Zoo again. So the Model Zoo is uh, really just a library of a whole bunch of different pre-built models in Detectron 2 that you can use. So um, if you weren't here before for the beginning, we talked about kind of like different versions of doing object detection and image segmentation. Those are all kind of different versions for accomplishing those goals in here. And there can be uh, certain cases to use one over the other. All right, so let me, I see some questions. I'll, I'll come back in a second. So here's uh, the output. This actually is the structure of um, the like ResNet, I believe, in here. Yeah, uh, background. And I think this, I forget where it says if it is. So, but it's using a ResNet as, oh yeah, here. So as the classifier underneath. So this is actually a structure of a neural network. This is kind of what it looks like in PyTorch. We're passing in all these different layers together. And it's a really big uh, network. So I'm going to scroll fast through it, but something interesting if you want to kind of look at that. Some of their output. And then so here it says, hey, uh, we read in your data set. We saw that there's one category in this case. It's a goose. There is 260 instances. So remember, um, I, I think, yeah, we only had 110 images, but a lot of those images had more than one goose in it. So it's saying there's 260 instances. Let me go ahead and start training on this. So it trained for 50 cycles, and then we run it on our um, validation data set. And uh, this is returning something called uh, uh, average precision and kind of different variations of it. So if it's like average precision over 50% uh, confidence, if it's a goose, um, this one's a 75, and then I think this is across all of those. Essentially, you want these numbers to be going up and as high as possible. I have a link in here that talks way more about kind of reading these metrics um, if you're interested. But just for now, starting out, you just kind of want these numbers uh, going up. And you can see this is very low. I didn't even know it was actually this low starting out. So it did 50 cycles. And it said, well, <laughs> the average precision is 2. Average precision of 50% uh, is uh, 11. These are all very low, but hopefully we see that going up. So that was just initially 50 cycles. This is 100. This jumped up quite a bit, right? Even especially just the, the 50. Um, threshold. It's almost 75. So again, another 50 cycles, looking pretty good. So it's definitely learning how to generalize and detect a goose uh, on images that it's never seen before. So you want these numbers going up. If they, were going, if they weren't going up or like stagnating or staying very low, um, then you'll probably want to add more data or change some hyperparameters. And I'm just going to keep scrolling down. So here's our last one. So it's a uh, 76 percent uh and this is really high for 50 really high for around 75 um i think this might include like a 95 or over 90 percent confidence or something so this this one you know the higher all these are the, the pretty good and that's all i really need to think about right now but you can read more about it again i have a link way more into these kind of metrics for object detection so I'm going to run this cell. This uh, launches a tensor board. Sometimes in the workshop, people will say that this doesn't launch for them. And I don't know a fix for that. But don't worry. Um, if it doesn't launch for you for some reason, it, it won't affect any other part of the workshop. And, all right. So we have something called the tensor board. This is a way of kind of plotting our output. And so here, it plotted our um, average precision. You can see it's going up. It even looks like it might be spiking up at the end there. So if we ran, you know, 100 more cycles, like it doesn't really look like it completely plateaued off, like it's still learning from the data. Um, if we ran 100 more cycles, our model might even be way better. So that, that could actually be something you could go do, go change a parameter in here. If you remember the parameter, change this 300 to like 400 or 500, you know, after the workshop and see if you get a, a better model than we did with just 300 cycles. 
And then uh, there's a lot of other things you can look at in here. Something you might want to look at is, you know, seeing how class accuracy is going up, false negatives going down, kind of just different metrics you can use in machine learning to see how well your model's doing during training. All right, so if you've never done computer vision before, or maybe you never even did deep learning, machine learning before, you just trained your very first computer vision algorithm or model. So congratulations. You should give yourself a round of applause. Um, and now we're gonna uh, see how to use that model on images and on video. But it's really cool. Uh, I think once you see it, you'll be way more excited because it's like, oh, I did. Uh, you did, you have an awesome model and it should be working pretty good. So um, this uh, LS, remember, this is just a, a terminal command and it's just looking in our output folder, but you can also go and visually go in this uh, up here, click this little folder icon. I'm a pretty visual person, so I like kind of looking around in here and seeing that, you know, here's my model final output dot PTH. That's a, a PyTorch version of saving a model. So kind of like we did for training, we're gonna load this model that we, we trained um, so that we can uh, use it on images and videos. And, and it's similar to setting up for training. Uh, someone said, are we free to use this code? Yeah, I mean, yeah, this, uh, this code is off, uh, a pretty similar, like a lot of this is taken from the Detectron 2 documentation. I just added kind of a lot more to make it a little bit more friendly to get started. But there's, there's nothing uh, crazy going on in here. So here we're setting up configuration just like we did when we were doing training. And then we're saying merge from file. This is again, where we define the architecture. So this needs to be the same as whatever you trained on. So if you change the upper one uh, to image segmentation, you'll also wanna change this down here to whatever the, the architecture is that you chose. And then instead of pointing the weights variable to the kind of predefined transfer learning weights for this, we wanna to point to our own. So here we're just saying, hey, look in our output directory and go get this model final path. So we're loading in our new weights from our train model. And then we're gonna have this uh, test data set defined and we're passing in whatever we named our test data. We called it my data set test. And then this is important. So if you added more classes to your data, then you'll want to change this number two. So again, we only had one class for our data, but you would want to change this to two or three, however many you had. And then this threshold is saying, um, only count it as a detection if it's 90% confident that it's the object, in this case, a goose. So if our model just wasn't super good uh, or just not that high, like you might want to start at doing 70% or 50% just to see what it's drawing. In this case, I'm just going to leave it at 90 though. And it's only going to draw a bounty box and return some, some sort of output if it's above the 90% uh, confidence that it's a goose. And then we're making a predictor and this is the, so what we're going to use to pass in an image and get some results returned. So run this. And now we have a variable test image path. We're just uh, literally passing an image from our validation data set. So you could go in here, go into image, copy one of these. I made sure that it was one in our validation data set and it wasn't one that, um, that it was trained on. So we'll see how accurate it is on a new piece of information. Reading in with uh, OpenCV, we're using this thing called outputs. That's actually giving us kind of, we'll, we'll look at what this actually looks like on its own, but that's giving us where to draw and the classification. Similar to before, we're drawing out our visualization. And uh, this is something you'll see a lot if you use PyTorch because when you run a model or train a model, you're often doing that on your GPU. But then when you're outputting something like an image or a drawing, uh, you wanna have those results move to the CPU for that. So if you ever see something like a two device or two CPU in PyTorch code, that's essentially what's happening. And it means that you were doing something on the GPU, but now you just wanna do it on the CPU. And ta-da. So did you run this and did you get a pretty good score on your geese? Did it work? Did it work for everyone? Awesome, awesome, hooray. Again, like I said, you, uh, you did uh, hopefully, or it could potentially be your first computer vision algorithm. It was really cool. You can already do a lot uh, just with this. So let's actually print 
I said we'll look at what um, an image looks like in computer vision or in Python. So if we print just the image that we read, it's just a giant array, you know, and, and these are color values, red, red, green, blue. Or if this isn't converted um, yet, it might be blue, green, red, because OpenCV reads it in the reverse order. So it's just a giant, giant array like this. Uh, but I just want to show because it's interesting to think about, right? You know, converting this image to an array like this, and then that's what uh, algorithms or models learn from. So let's look at what is actually being returned in our output. So this is actually, when we feed an image to our model, this is what's coming out of it. So here we um, fed an image, it gives us some dimensions of the image. And then it's saying number of instances is it counted two. So I'll clear this, one and two, looks good. And then we have this boxes kind of object here. And it has you know, the coordinates of where to draw those rectangles. So we have one, two, three, four, and then a, a list of one, two, three, four more. And that's what's drawing around here. And then the, the class scores. So you know, it's 98% you know, sure that it's a goose. And the other one is, uh, or sorry, this one's 90, 99. You see it rounded up. And this one's 97, again, rounded up to 98. And then the predicted classes here are zero and zero. And that correlates to the way the information is fed in. So we only had one class, so there's only zero. If you've never programmed in Python, um, and actually most programming language, languages, indexing starts at zero. So usually zero, you can think of it as one. So if you had multiple classes here, let's say a goose and a duck, um, and there was one of each in here, this would be like zero and then a one. And the zero would correlate to a goose, and the one would correlate to duck. And the cool thing about this is, uh, like I was saying, sometimes you don't even need to draw down an image. Like, this is great. This looks awesome because we're humans. But you can make decisions and do things with uh, algorithms you know, just based on this. Like, you can understand where an object is um, in relation to another object just by looking at the coordinates of where they are in an, in an image. You know, is there any overlapping? How many were in there? You can just kind of print that out. So here's just an example. It's saying, you know, detected two geese. And if we had three, it would say detected three geese. So you can already do quite a bit um, just with this. Like maybe the solution or the problem you're trying to solve is like, I want to know how many animals are in this picture, or how many animals are in my yard at a time or something like that, and have it kind of printing out those results or doing something like uh, um, if a raccoon is on your porch, maybe it squirts a water bottle at them or something like that. And let's, uh, let's do it on another image. And ta-da. So this is, uh, like I was saying, this data set kind of has some geese photoshopped in interesting areas uh, because I made it kind of for a different talk originally. So um, I'm going to go through this other stuff really fast. And then I will definitely make sure uh, to be hanging around and answer your questions. So we're almost done. We're going to get a really cool video. And then we can go back and go through anything that didn't quite make sense to you. So here, um, I have some links here that, again, go more into those uh, evaluation metrics, and I recommend you reading them. But essentially, what we're doing here is doing what we did on that validation set per 50 cycles, except for on a holdout test data set. So this is data that we didn't use while tuning our model and data that the, the model never saw during training. And so we can see the scores here are pretty similar to our validation data set because the geese are pretty similar um, you know, in all the images. So let's run it on a video. Um, here's a video I have that's just some geese walking around. And then we're going to run a classifier on it. There's a library called uh, YouTube Download. So that's just what we're installing here. And that's just going to allow us to download this video and then run our model on it. I'm calling YouTube Download, passing it the URL to my video. Um, and then I'm saying it save as video.mp3. So it'll show up in my library here as video.mp3. And then our video is pretty short, so we don't really need to do this, but this is really convenient. And I think this is even shown in kind of the um, Detectron 2 documentation, maybe of running it on a video where uh, we're using a library called FFmpeg and we're looking at that video.mp4. And then we're just going to take a six second clip of it. Because if you have a video that is like 10 minutes long and you run your model on it, which you totally can't do, but it'll take a long time to kind of write it, 
everything out. Um, so what I like to do is always test it on a short clip to make sure that the model is performing pretty well, because otherwise maybe it's wasting my time writing everything out for an hour or something. So we're just going to create a six second clip and we're saving that as video clip.mp4. So that's actually what we want to run our model on right now. Got a lot of information on output. And then here, um, I'm going to go ahead and run these next two code cells because they can take a little bit. You can see that if you run this, it's a uh, giving us a percentage written out. That means it's writing our video and running our model on it. And then I'm going to run this next code cell. Um, it'll run once this is done and that'll download our file so we can look at our, our video for the object detection. So what's going on here is we're importing several visualizers from Detectron 2. We're getting some information about our video. It's just like how many frames are there. Uh, you can get the width and height, a whole bunch of cool kind of stuff built into OpenCV to under, uh, um, take understanding around your video. Um, and then we're creating a variable called video writer. We're using that video writer function of Detectron 2. And we want to, uh, or, or uh, sorry, OpenCV. And we want to save to out.mp4. So that's going to be the file we want to download where we're going to have our uh, video written out. Some other parameters in here you can mess with, like frames per second and stuff. If you want to get specific type of video you want to save it out as. Here we're feeding in our meta catalog. So this is actually just getting kind of the classes. So it's going to write out goose on the video. If you had multiple classes in here, this would be getting you know, goose and duck or whatever you're training your, your detector on. And here's our function that's actually writing out the video. Um, it's essentially just saying, you know, while there's still frames left in our video file, take the frame, um, you know, take the next frame we haven't looked at yet, run our predictor on it, just like we did at those images above. And we're kind of doing similar things to it, except for we're just kind of um, yielding that visualization out of that loop and then using the uh, video writer. So it's taking that visualization and just uh, writing them together. And my, my thing downloaded, my video downloaded. I'm going to open it up and hopefully it worked. Hurrah! We have detections happening on geese. Pretty good. So I think it's like 99% confident on all these and it's not wrong. So it looks good to me. And again, if you have, um, you know, more complicated data, then it, it might be lower confidence. Uh, again, in our case, we're pretty fortunate because geese look very similar. Each geese, I can't tell them apart as a human, right? Excellent. out of that. So did that work for everyone? Cool. And um, again, kind of all the links to a lot of stuff to keep learning and uh, read more about can be found at the bottom of this uh, collab. And then I'm just going to paste these links into the chat, though. Here's all the good places to uh, follow me at and ask questions later, especially if you have any questions about labeling. Um, something isn't working in here, let me know. And uh, I'm going to stop this recording, but I'm going to be hanging around and uh, answering any questions people have. So hang on a second.